Get that down. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm starting on the dot of seven because, gosh, we've got an action packed hour and a half ahead. Uh, my name is Nigel Windsor, and it gives me great pleasure uh, welcoming you all here tonight to the RGS on behalf of all my Earthwatch colleagues, and I hope you have a chance to meet them tonight. Larry, great to have you with us. Larry Mason, our new CEO from Boston, it's great to have you with us tonight. And next to you, Julie and your colleague, actually, James isn't here, actually, I was going to say, and James. Julie uh, from the Mitsubishi Corporation Fund for Europe and Africa, who supports this lecture, so you guys don't have to pay. So, Julie, you and your team are very great, grateful for all you do. Now 20 years in supporting us. Thank you. What a great turnout. You are the growing Earthwatch community, and it's nice to see many old friends and new faces, I see. The growing Earthwatch community, you are all important to us. For working with us on our global research projects, and I know many of you have been hard field scientists in the field, doing the hard work. I was talking to David Earl just before, and he was reminding me that actually sometimes in the field it is very hard work. It's not quite as pretty as our brochure dictates. And for what you've done in the past as field scientists, 40 years of collective work as strong field scientists. Part of tonight is, what are we going to do in the next 40 years? Thank you, thank you, thank you for your energy and your commitment for what you've done for us. It means a great deal to me, it means a great deal to my Earthwatch colleagues, and it means a great deal to my Earthwatch trustees who are here tonight. In addition to you very special people, we also welcome from all corners of the world those listening live to this lecture on the web through our new Earthwatch webinar facility. We hope you can hear us clearly around the world and we hope you will ask a question or two at the end. So we've got a hundred people listening to us from Timbuktu to Kuala Lumpur. I'd like to particularly mention Dave Rerick, who is a skipper right now on the ocean seas um, with an ocean racing boat called Bodacious Dream, currently sailing the high seas, raising awareness for marine issues, and of course, helping us with our work. Thank you, Dave. I hope you can hear us, and I hope you are able to see uh, the imagery. Also rather special, largely partly to our speakers today, Jean-Michel Cousteau and his team are listening in. I hope you're there, Jean-Michel and Holly and your team. How the wonders of technology can bring together leaders in the marine world to share a special moment with our two speakers, Jay and Anna. I think it's marvelous. We know you all share our vision, the Earthwatch vision, a world where we live within our means and a world where with, we live in harmony with nature, a world fit for purpose, for 10 billion people by 2050. But how do we achieve this? Tonight we are exploring new territories, a territory between emotion and the conservation of nature. By understanding how one impacts the other, our collective chances of achieving a sustainable world radically increases. Our grandchildren will thank us for this debate. My colleague Ben Jack, We'll wrap up the evening. We have two distinguished world-class speakers from California and New Mexico. So to steer us on our journey tonight, please welcome a courageous and good friend of Earthwatch, explorer, campaigner, polar traveler, often seen with the BBC in front of camera, stalwart advocate of citizen science, and above all, one of our five Earthwatch ambassadors. Please welcome to the London stage, Mr. Paul Rose. Hey, thanks very much, Nigel, and good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks so much for coming here to the Royal Geographical Society, my spiritual home. But I'd also like to apologize that we, you've come inside. We're talking about a spiritual and emotional engagement with nature, and the only way to do it is to come in and close the doors, which does seem a bit ludicrous. And as soon as we get Nigel and his great team to organize a 600-person Earthwatch expedition, 
then we'll have that debate, the next debate, version two, if you like, in the field on an enormous citizen science club. What do you reckon? Great stuff. Um, there, there really are over seven billion of us now. And for the first time in history, we really have become a true force of nature. And yet, the way we've grown, we're all living, as we all know, most of us, in the urban setting. So we've never lived so far from nature, whilst at the same time needing it so much. And when I think of the way that we engage people in global issues and debates and discussions where I ask or transmit uh, what I hope is meaningful and informed opinions, I find that those people who don't get close to nature can't debate properly. They can't get engaged in the issue. It's too big of a leap. If you live in an entirely urban environment and get all of your information from the television, uh, the press, and the internet, and have this assumption that you know everything because you've, you've caught it on the net, and oh yeah, I know about that and I've been there. Of course we don't, unless we actually go out there and ground truth it ourselves. It's an enormous leap to go from a, a, a focused urban environment to understanding and contributing on the debate to big global issues. We absolutely have to have that essential connection to nature. And it has to be emotional. How else could it possibly be? And it, I'll ask you later as to where you got yours. Where is your defining transformative experience in nature? When did it first happen? I'll share mine. I was 11, in love with Jacques Cousteau, Hans Huss, and particular Mike Nelson three diving heroes on the television. I knew that Jacques Cousteau was living the world's, you know, the, the, the men's ultimate dream of living at sea. He'd co-invented scuba diving. He'd already been living underneath the Red Sea in Conshelf too. And there he was, traveling the world with his team on Calypso. Hans Huss was making those fantastic black and white shark documentaries using ex-military rebreather gear. And for an 11-year-old boy, you can imagine how I felt about Mike Nelson. He was having proper bloke's adventures at sea. He was played by Lloyd Bridges, and he came on my television screen in Romford, Essex, about every other week. And there he was. He was rescuing people from flooded mines. He was rescuing men uh, when their, their jets had crashed. And all the beautiful women in the world fell in love with Mike and wanted him to teach him to dive. And I was 11, living in a council flat in Romford, Essex. I just failed my 11 plus, um, and I knew nothing in life except I had to be a diver. And what was very interesting is that then when I became a diver in 1969, that first dive in the sea was exactly as I felt it was going to be. I, still, I can still sense that I was down in, in, in Chessel Cove in Portland where I'm going tomorrow, and that first dive when the, when the sea came in my suit, obviously I'd made it myself, quite obviously a la Cousteau, it had, uh, sorry Jean-Michel, had the yellow stripes, so I felt that I was part of the Cousteau gang, and it leaked like a sieve, but I knew how it was going to work. I knew what it was like to get in there. For the first time in my life, I had that connection with the ocean. The size of it, the scale of it, the immeasurable vastness of it, and the sense of vitality and freedom that I had. I can still sense that. After that dream of being a diver at 11, I continued my terrible studies and didn't learn much at all, except that uh, dreaming of being a diver was never going to get me through school and get me to pass exams. And when I was 14, I was recognized um, by our geography teacher, maybe that's why I'm here today at the Royal Geographical Society, as someone that needed some extra help. I was falling through the cracks. Teachers were the enemy. School was the enemy. I can still, if I think about it, not very hard, I can still smell those overheated radiators in that school and the sense of being trapped. And he took us, uh, me and all my um, Herbert mates, for want of a better term, uh, to the Brecon Beacons. And we went walking and climbing and jumped down river streams and got lost. And it was fantastic. I suddenly discovered I could do this. And even better was that some of those young ones who were cruising school turned out to be quite hopeless in the outdoors. And so in my state of mind at that time, that was an important thing. I loved it when I heard Mr. Gray shout down those gullies, you'll lose your life down there, boy, when they'd obviously gone the wrong way. And I remember being brought almost to tears because I was far too proud to show those tears when he praised me. And he said, you know what, you're doing all right. You got, and I remember thinking, he means this. And I, really, I was far too proud to show any emotion, but I shall never forget that day. And I remember being back at the Merthyr Tidful Youth Hostel that first night. I've never been in that setting before, peeling potatoes into a bucket. 
bashing spuds, and I'd never felt so alive or in tune with myself and nature ever. It was an enormous event. I was 14, knew nothing in life, except not only was I going to be a diver, but I was going to be alongside nature as much as humanly possible. Um, there is increasing evidence that our emotional connection to, to, to nature and place not only enhances our positive feelings and boosts well-being, but it also has real influence on how people think and behave towards each other and understand nature. And there's something about understanding how we value nature and finding ways to deepen our connection with it that, is, that benefits not just us, but also our shared environment. So how do we get started? Well, we need to start with the feeling that we're going on an expedition. We can't have the doors and windows open. We can't actually be on an expedition until Nigel gets us organized on a 600-person Earthwatch project. But if I look around, I look around, I don't see that you're carrying tents and stoves and food and fuel and communication kit and sleeping bags and heavy sledges and all this technical gear, which is great. You're traveling light. You're traveling with the barest minimum of essentials, which means this is going to be a great adventure because we're going to be living on the edge. We're, we're going to be only just warm enough, only just comfortable enough. We're bound to get lost. We may even get a little bit frightened on the way. Who knows? But one thing I can assure you, it's going to be emotional. So to get started, um, I have our first um, speaker, uh, Dr. Anna Stefan, and she's going to explain, um, explore the strong emotional connection um, in mountain, mountainous environments like New Mexico's uh, Via, 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 Via Caldera to the human psyche and the values people hold um, in nature linked up um, to their historical associations with the past, uh, human use, and our culture. So I'd like to give us a big Earthwatch RGS welcome to Dr. Anna. Thank you, Nigel. Well, let's just take a moment to look out. I'm so pleased to be here, and I'm very excited to be able to introduce everyone here, as well as our web audience, to a place that not a lot of people have seen before um, outside of New Mexico. So I'm going to talk this evening about the landscapes of the Valles Caldera in northern New Mexico, and a little bit about the archaic period and how that translates into archaic landscapes and how, what lessons we can learn from that for moving forward. Essentially, my talk is a, is a case study and a specific place-based land management. And from that, I think that we'll be able to um, gather some broader uh, lessons and ideas. So just a moment before we continue going forward, I would like to um, confess that aside from my family, the Valles Caldera is the love of my life. And thank you, Jay, our next speaker, for emboldening me to be willing to state that. I hope that over the course of this presentation and some of the slides, you can come to enjoy it as well. The Valles Caldera is located at the center of the Jemez Mountains, which are at the southern end of the Rocky Mountains in north central New Mexico. So they join together that mountain chain as well as the, northern, the plains to the north and the deserts to the south. It's, it's the area that's high in elevation, and that's very important. Everything there is above 8,500 feet, um, and that means that almost all of the caldera is simply too high in elevation to sustain agriculture. It, the growing season is just too short. A caldera is a particular kind of volcanic formation um, that's formed as a collapsed crater, um, but it's a very large feature, and it forms from a very large eruption. Yellowstone, for example, is a caldera in North America, only much, much longer, so this larger. This isn't the largest or the oldest or the newest or the anythingest caldera, other than that it's extremely easy to see and to recognize that landscape. So you can see the circular ring of the caldera collapse, and then inside are the domes that formed afterwards. Those are very rounded and soft shapes, um, forested with the large grasslands in between. Until the year 2000, the area had always been privately owned, um, first beginning as a land grant in 1860. And each of the subsequent owners, um, a couple of them, or a couple of the families that owned it, had considered developing the landscape, breaking it up, and over time after owning it, decided not to because it was simply too beautiful. 
and that we have, we, have, we have that documented in oral histories, that decision process. When we were created by Congress um, as a national preserve, the decision was made not to put us into the normal national park system, but instead to create us as an experiment in land management. We're tasked with preserving and protecting the natural, cultural, scenic values of the place, creating opportunities for public access and enjoyment, and also to continue uh, using it as a working ranch to preserve that aspect of American heritage. So take a few moments to give you a chance to see this place. The, most of the rains that we get here are during the summertime, hard rains um, during July and August. And that provides the context to create the streams, as well as the deep soils, the tall grasses that grow there. Excellent forage for the cattle, but also for large herds of elk. The snows start in November, and by December it's hard to get in, and the elk leave. Our herd size is between two and 4,000 head of elk during the summertime, and when the snows get too deep, they leave. No people live on the caldera in the wintertime. The snows are much too deep, and it's much too cold. That's true now, and it's been true for 10,000 years. The snows start to melt in March, and it's pretty fast in April. The snow melt fills the valleys below, like lakes. That starts to drain out. We can return back inside and see the land. I've never stood on the side of the road or entered into the caldera with people seeing it first, for the first time when they weren't awestruck. It's a beautiful environment that people um, experience, not just that it's special, but that it's very, very special. And it's, it's obvious, you know, that humans universally love beautiful landscapes, but I've had a chance to think about that and consider it. And it's pretty clear that our appreciation of landscape beauty is more than just something incidental to our survival. It's inherent in our adaptation. It's how we recognize our landscape um, that can become our home. It's how we recognize that we are in a healthy habitat. And I liked uh, what I learned from one of our researchers, Suzanne Gifford. She's been mapping uh, locations of coyote dens on the caldera for several years. And she noticed that over time, it seemed like almost every time she started working on mapping a coyote den, she noticed just how extraordinarily beautiful the spot was. And it makes sense to me. You can recognize that you have what you need. You have enough water, abundant resources, perhaps some shelter, and the ability to see long distances to see if there's any problems or dangers to come. So that, rec that, that feeling of, of beauty, feeling that we're home in each place, um, is how we know we're in the right place. I don't know what coyotes are thinking or feeling when, they, when they're choosing that as their location, but I know what I feel when I'm there, and that is I feel like I'm in a place where I can be nourished, where I'm safe, where I have something to offer, that I'm home. So the word that people use over the years to describe this feeling look on the landscape, looking on the landscape is pristine, and that sort of befuddles the staff at the Valles Caldera because we're very familiar with just all the different things that have happened to this landscape to keep it from being truly pristine. It's been heavily grazed um, by sheep prior to World War II and then after that by cattle. And um, it has been logged starting in the 1930s and brutally logged in the 60s and 70s. So the landscape isn't untouched. But I realize that people are not making a mistake when they call it pristine. It's not that they're overlooking the past impacts, but rather those aren't significant to their recognition of what's there. Instead, they see the landscape that you can see. This looks like a pretty good place. And, and you can feel that um, in your heart or your gut, wherever it is that that feeling um, resides. What I look at, what I recognize when I see this, is that clearly it's not a developed landscape. But more than just undeveloped, it's also not an agricultural landscape, which is important, and that's where the elevation comes into play in this particular place. So when I put on my anthropologist hat and look out on the landscape, I see what I would call two cultural landscapes. I see the landscape of the ranching heritage. Um, the, you can see the roads faintly and even more faintly the lines that are the fences. But then there's that beautiful natural backdrop to it. And that cultural landscape is what I call the cultural landscape of the archaic, the archaic landscape. Now I know that's not a particularly familiar term and I'll take it up in a moment, but the focus really 
is on not that it's unused, but that it's not developed with agriculture. So looking from above, I was trying to figure out some way both to express the scale of this place and also to demonstrate the lack of agricultural development. So I got a picture of the Stonehenge landscape to put on there. Zoom in a little way. So Stonehenge is that dot there and just a little bit to the right of the center of that space. That gives you an idea of scale, but you can see that even surrounding that rugged cultural landscape, there are those, the field areas that aren't present inside the valley, the Valle Grande, the, the largest valley on the Valles Caldera. So this is a landscape that is protected, is um, not, is, is relatively undisturbed by certain kinds of fragmenting activities, um, but it's not an unused landscape. This area was intensely, well, well occupied throughout the entire archaic period. So what is that that I'm referring to? There's an archaic period in North American prehistory is the period of human occupation after the Pleistocene but before agriculture and would be the, the mesolith here would be the term that would be used for it. It's essentially an 8,000 year span of time where people thrived in the environment. Um, after the foraging and, and mapping onto the landscape and before the agricultural developments of the Puebloan era. It's the largest part of the Holocene before the most recent period. So archaic people um, lived as a standard hunting gathering kind of existence that we're familiar with, um, eating fish, hunting game of all different sizes, up from the large elk, of course, all the way down to frogs, toads, grasshoppers. Um, they were fishing, using waterfowl, and a whole variety of plant and vegetable resources like seeds, nuts, berries, grains. And we're familiar with this kind of adaptation. It's also important to note, these are folks who are using very large territories, moving around large regions, perhaps coming back to a location each year, perhaps not for a couple of years. And the real important message about these folks is they're not doing this randomly. In fact, they are resource specialists. They are absolute experts in using the area that they're living in. So that matters. That matters today. As we're looking back from where we are today, living with the consequences of population expansion and um, our incredible success with agriculture, it's important for us to look back and recognize that the archaic period was the last period during which human adaptation was sustainable. There are lessons there for us to learn. The caldera archaeology is an exquisite record of the archaic because it hasn't been obliterated or transformed by agricultural populations using it, agricultural transformations on top of it. So what we have is a very long span of time where we can study not only human adaptation, but also interaction with an environment in which we are not degrading our own habitat. Now, for most people, um, if they think about the American Southwest and the archaeological record of the Southwest, what they're much more familiar with are these other areas. These are all locations that are just surrounding the caldera. There are three World Heritage Sites, Talos Pueblo, Mesa Verde National Park, Chaco National Park, Chaco Canyon National Park, um, and also right next door is Bandelier National Park, um, all of which obviously are representing that later time period. We have not yet developed a location for people to go to learn about and interpret and study the archaic um, like we have available to us today with the Bias Caldera National Preserve. Here's what our sites look like on the caldera. They're pretty different. For one, they're not three-dimensional. <laughs> um, there are no above-ground masonry structures. We don't have bits of pottery. Certainly no um, artifacts are being made out of metal. What we have instead are large and small scatters of artifacts, mostly stone artifacts, or particularly um, artifacts made out of obsidian, which is abundant inside this volcanic landscape. So the obsidian tools, as well as the debris, the debitage left over from manufacturing those tools. Much of the work that we've been doing for the past 10, year on the, 10 years on the caldera since we were created has focused on trying to survey the surface. So we've, we've surveyed nearly 20% at this point and recorded um, 660 archaeological sites. Probably when we're all done, it'll be around 2,000 archaeological sites. It wasn't until last year that we decided to initiate a program to move forward into looking at the Holocene, the potential for Holocene studies and human interaction during that earlier time period. There are three records that are particularly useful. There are the forests. That takes you back a thousand years, maybe 2,000 under certain circumstances. 
but you can also study the obsidian and the soils, and both of those um, avenues for, for study will take you back several millennia. Um, key is the use of obsidian, and there's several things you can do with obsidian to look at this record. What the one I'll mention is that every obsidian artifact can be geochemically sourced back to where it came from. So I just think that's amazing. But you, this is true for obsidian all over the world, that you can figure out for any artifact where the person who made the artifact dropped the artifact, where they, they got it from. So when you map that on to the, United, to the North America, um, the Vias Caldera is that yellow and red dot in there, and every other dot shows an archaeological site where an, an, artifact has, an obsidian artifact has been um, geochemically proven to come from the caldera. So it gives you some kind of an idea of the range and the relevance of this location to um, human use of the central part of the continent. So as we decided to, we were ready to move forward into um, studying the subsurface and looking at the potential for Holocene um, studies, um, we had been waiting to develop a project that we felt was suitable to work with Earthwatch. So we decided in 2003, only a couple years into um, our cultural resources program, just after starting the, the preserve, that we wanted to work with Earthwatch and we felt it was an excellent partnership for us. So it wasn't until um, 20, 2009 that we felt that we had a project that was ready and we started doing excavations in Obsidian Valley in, 2000, in just last year. We did two sessions and the outcomes exceeded our expectations. Um, we worked with volunteers to look at the subsurface and assess the potential and in many other areas on the caldera where we had done small test probes, etc., we really had found tremendous disturbance in the soils. And here we found an area that's not disturbed, but the promise is extraordinary. We'll be starting our next session in about five weeks, and I'm really looking forward to what we can uncover this year. As with the, the Earthwatch group, as other groups that we work with, we always start by orienting to this landscape, both to feel the scale of it at the large before we enter into it and work intimately by getting dirty down in the dirt. But under any circumstances, business as usual changes if there are disturbance events like a forest fire. The Less Conscious Fire started in the summer of 2011. It was an accidentally sparked fire just to the south of the caldera. Fires like this move quickly by throwing embers out ahead. And this fire was an extraordinary example. In the first 12 hours of the fire, it had already burned more than the previous largest forest fire on record. Before it stopped growing, after about two weeks, it had burned over 150,000 acres, and a third of the preserve had burned. When there's a fire going on, it's a state of siege. It's a state of tremendous fear, anxiety, all of us wanting so badly to find some way to help to protect this environment. And all we can do is support the firefighters, make food for them. That's much of the time what we do and then we go out after to see what's left. This is a view from south of the, of the uh, preserve, looking north. The far distant landscape is the rim of the caldera. Um, and this is a very painful experience to see this landscape for those of us who have been there for a long time. But for any human being, we can look at this and we can recognize that this is not our habitat. This is not a healthy, safe, nourishing environment. It's something else entirely. The experience of grief and loss is quickly, quickly, a little bit, maybe I'm overstating, but there's a beginning of hope that sprouts as the plants start to regrow. And fortunately, the grasslands are particularly encouraging. They regrow very, very quickly. Within just a few weeks, the elk are back out grazing. And I, they like it much better, but no, but you know, there, there is um, a, a tremendous relief that comes watching the green come back again. For the forest, it's not nearly that simple and it's not gonna be nearly that quick, but we were fortunate in the caldera that while a third of it burned, about half of the burned areas did not burn at the worst severity levels, levels but instead in this kind of mosaic pattern that you see here. And then the rains came, the rain started and within the first couple of events, we lost nearly all the topsoil on slopes. It, the, the sediment comes down, it chokes the creeks, there's splash floods, wide, wide broad floods, 
it's a very, uh, very transforming um, few weeks after the fire. And there's only one sane response for the staff of the Vice Caldera, and that's to get out there and to start monitoring it. To move across the landscape with our fire clothes on and get monitoring stations in the ground so that if an event like this is something that we couldn't prevent, at least we can learn from it and learn a tremendous amount from these rapid events on much more cumulative long-term effects that have occurred in these environments at that time. We had already made a, a, a commitment, Dr. Par Bob Parmenter, the preserve scientist, had made a commitment to monitoring, so we already had many years of baseline data at a diverse set of monitoring stations across the caldera. So we were able to add these um, new monitoring stations on top and be able to and then add in the data from the existing ones to see what happened with, the, with this kind of an event. Well, there's a tremendous amount we can learn from these experiences. So while the first responses are, are, are a great deal of distress, um, we can quickly recognize that there's a lot to be gained here. And this is an important thing because in the Southwest, we recognize that we are one of those regions in the world that is most rapidly or quickly uh, rapidly affected by climate warming. So there's an opportunity for us to provide some insight and some help um, in, for other areas as well who are experiencing the same kinds of problems. Because it's also important for us to realize, and well, we recognize on a daily basis there, that this is still something that could continue. So these um, maps show the uh, drought status on the, on the left. You can see what it looked like just before the less conscious fire. And then you can see also what it looks like today. So the drought conditions are just as bad as they were then, and in fact are much more widespread. There's a very real possibility of having another less conscious fire that will then take out the rest of the forest of the Hamas Mountains. So this is a real concern that we need to be involved with, um, especially because these are not regular forest fires. These are not the natural forest fires that are part of the cycle but to be expected in this kind of environment. Instead, these are fires that are much larger than they should be. The slide shows all the, um, the fires shown here. These are all the fires that have occurred since the turn of the last century. And all of the large ones have occurred since the 1960s. It's re the result of suppressing forest fires and um, the, the uh, frightening statements from Smokey Bear being a good deal too effective, perhaps. Yeah, not, not perhaps, for sure. And um, the dense biomass that you get in these landscapes that are ecologically require fire in order to function. So we're, um, the thing to do, well, the only thing you can do in the face of these kinds of problems, and this is true of everywhere, is to foster incremental growth, I mean, inter incremental change. That's the only thing that can be done. So um, fortunately, we have already had in place, starting in 2010, the Southwest Hamas Collaborative Forest Last landscape restoration program, um, which is shown in the area of the dotted white line. You can see that a, 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 por a portion of that area was burned in the less conscious fire, but much of it is still intact. This is a project where we're working with all of the federal land um, agent management agencies in the area, a whole series of non-government or organizations like the Forest Guild, Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, and then a number of different tribal, tribal governments um, to work together, leverage our ability, get out there, thin the forest, and use prescribed fire on the landscape to break it up so that large fires won't happen if we get a mosaic there in place. So going forward, then, it's clear that, uh, from the example that we've experienced on the caldera, that while dealing with climate change and climate variability is one that is confusing and difficult because of the complexity of all of the components to it, it's probably resource management may actually be the easier part of it. The more important part, the, the part we really need to get a handle on, is learning how to manage our emotions and learning how to manage how we feel about the situation. Getting stuck in fear isn't going to help us. Getting drifting off into denial isn't going to help us in the situation. Instead, accepting what some of the loss may be, accepting that that's an incredibly painful experience to have, but as stewards of the landscape, we can get together and figure out solutions to the problem and how to move forward. At the Caldera, we're committed to providing a context for that to happen. 
we are providing a scientific environment to study not just the present um, ecology, but also the historical ecology going back through the Holocene, looking at humans' interactions with that landscape and seeing what we can learn from it. Um, we also are committed to fostering direct interaction between people and the environment so that they too can have whatever the experiences are that they're going to have. Some of those experiences we, we seek to um, provide context for and others we simply allow them to experience it directly on their own. We are focused on, um, on preserving soundscapes, preserving viewscapes. We have, air, uh, we have um, a visitor center in the works and it's 100% green and we've also just gotten a grant for um, solar shuttles that are completely silent to take people out. We have our roads right now are 100% unpaved. If there's any paving to happen in the future, it probably will be small amounts to come. We offer um, direct opportunities to take people out to see the healthy parts of the preserve as well as some of the less healthy parts of the preserve to see what um, opportunities are there for restoration. Overall, it's a landscape and recovery, and we want people to experience that directly on their own terms um, and with an, an opportunity for interpretation and education. The last thing I want to mention, because I think it's really critical, or it's really key, is that we also have an opportunity, given where we're located, we're only one to two hours from the largest urban centers in New Mexico, we have an opportunity to bring children out on this landscape. Now, that probably here a lot of folks are familiar with studies that have shown really high proportions of nearsightedness in school children um, from learning so much this far from their face, or perhaps the distance of a screen, or at most the distance between them and an instructor. A, a landscape like the Valles Caldera is one in which people can experience their own scale within nature as well as focus on the long term, I mean the long view, and develop the kind of perspective needed to go forward and to manage um, not only the complexity of the changing environment, but also the complexity of our own responses to it. it the, the, the imperative is there. We have these fires, but that's not the only threat. If it's not unreasonable to imagine that within 100 years, as with, with warming, that the movement of the forest structure up the mountains may mean that this is the last place in New Mexico, one of the last places in New Mexico people can go to see ponderosa pines. So we're there to make sure that happens and to make sure that people can enjoy it as it stays there. Thank you. Well, great stuff. Thanks very much, Anna. Uh, we're off to a tremendous start. Uh, I don't know about you, but, but I want to go there. And Nigel, it's big enough for all of us for the, for the next time we do this outside, you see. Next. Um, the way this will work, we won't take questions at the moment or, or, or debate, but we'll move right on, if we can, uh, to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jay Nichols. He's a marine biologist, um, um, turtle expert, and a conservationist. He's also the man who gave you the blue marble. Um, he'll explain that in a bit. And uh, as well as uh, putting forth his point that it's essential for us to have an e emotional connection to the oceans, and don't we know it, um, he's going to take us through an exciting uh, emerging field of something called neuroconservation. So I'd like to give us a big, warm Earthwatch welcome to Dr. Jane Nichols, please. <laughs> Well, I've come to London to the Royal Geographical Society from a, a small town in California called Davenport, population 300. We're surrounded by strawberry fields, really, the strawberry fields, and the ocean. And I, I was a bit intimidated to come here today. But then I walked through the doors and met some folks, and I felt the love for this place. And I walked into the mat room and looked at some of the very old, beautiful maps, and I felt the love from those maps, if you can imagine, what it took to create those maps, and all the, ha the hands that have touched them as they've set out to explore the world. And then I walked in here this evening and felt the love in the room. So I, I am really talking about the L word. That's what it's all about. And if you haven't figured it out by now, the L word is love. My, um, 
My personal journey into falling in love or more deeply in love with nature goes back also to when I was 11 years old. And I was in the Rocky Mountains in the snowy range with my uncles. And this photograph takes me right back to that moment. I can literally feel the grass again under my feet standing there. And I can smell the mountain air. And I can taste the trout that we caught in that lake. I can hear the, the coyotes and the wolves howling outside of our tents at night. The vivid sensory memory of that moment and that place, is, I've carried it with me for my whole life. But 11 years old, like Paul, I was enthralled by the ocean. I was really an, an ocean kid, and I was dreaming about being with Jacques Cousteau, traveling the world. And I really loved turtles for some reason. What I loved most was to catch turtles in the Chesapeake Bay and paint numbers on their shells and then put them back in the water and then sometimes recapture them. And then when we recapture them, we'd use simple algebra to more or less figure out the population size. So we were young turtle geeks and also math geeks. And there was nothing better than doing algebra about turtles. <laughs> and I don't have a photo from that moment. Otherwise, I'd be sharing it. This is the best I could do. <laughs> that is a snapping turtle, by the way, right there. But I, I grew up, and I carried that passion for turtles forward into my young adult life, into graduate school. And I started to see turtles everywhere, sometimes where there weren't turtles, like that one. That one lasted for a millisecond, and then it was gone forever. There's a more obvious turtle, the stone turtle. And I, you know, when I'm, when I'm in a room like this, there's always one or two people <laughs> who remind me of a little bit of a turtle. I've been told myself that I look a bit like a turtle, so we're in good company. But I took my passion for turtles to Mexico because Mexico is the world capital of sea turtles. It has more species, more numbers of turtles. It's a, just a very turtly place. So I took my passion for turtles there, and I decided to do my doctoral work there. And I, I remember stepping up to my father and telling him, hey, Dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study turtles. And he said, what are you going to do with turtles, son? And I looked him in the eye, and I said, everything. And he said, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and I said, I, I have no idea what that means either. But let's find out. So I went to Baja, California, Mexico to study turtles. And what I found there was um, a black market, an illegal black market for sea turtles. I found a, a populate, populations of sea turtles that were literally on the brink and being pushed ever closer to the edge, about to be wiped out forever ecologically extinct, economically extinct, and almost completely extinct. And I remember investigating the situation and finding more problems than just the poaching, but fisheries bycatch, turtles being caught in nets and in gear and for, by people who weren't trying to catch them, but just accidentally they would get caught in the nets and on the long line hooks. The pro it was pretty grim. And the experts of the world had said, it's too late. It's too late for Baja sea turtles. They're gone, and we advise you to skip over them. Don't go there. Don't study them. It's impossible. Just go study fish somewhere else. Maybe move down to Costa Rica and study the turtles there. And I remember telling my graduate committee that I was going to do it anyway. And they said, defend yourself. Show us some data. And I didn't have any data. I just had a lot of bad news about the situation, about laws that weren't being enforced. But I said something about dignity. In Jesus Lucero's eyes, you, you feel the dignity. The man is connected to the ocean. The man is connected to the peninsula. And I felt the, the community, the community engagement. In Baja California, if somebody's in trouble on the side of the road, nobody passes them by because it's a harsh place. You never pass somebody by who needs help. And I felt that. I felt that community feeling. And the compassion, very passionate culture in Latin America. Compassionate, passionate, community-oriented 
people with full of dignity. But I didn't have a lot of support for the project, so I applied to Earthwatch. And they saw it too, something about the proposal and something about the audacity of it or something about the turtles and the possibility. And Earthwatch said, we'll give you a grant. We'll work with you. We'll send volunteers. Let's give it a shot. Thank goodness, because that was our lifeline for these sea turtles. And we formed something we call the Grupo Tortuguero, which loosely translates to turtle people group. You know, not so fancy sounding, but hi, we're the turtle people group. And we're here to save the turtles. But the Grupo Tortuguero was made up of turtle hunters, turtle fishermen, turtle eaters, people who had grown up eating and hunting sea turtles, spending their life doing that. An unlikely group of bedfellows for sea turtle conservation. And we had a very simple approach, which was to build the networks and the relationships, to generate the knowledge and the understanding through science, through social science, through indigenous knowledge, and then to give it all away, to share wildly, to communicate, to bring more people into the network, to do more work, and to keep sharing. Very simple model, and that was our approach. And the network has grown tremendously. There are more than 50 communities throughout the 3,000 miles of coastal northwestern Mexico. Thousands of people, dozens of new organizations, and every year it keeps getting bigger. Now, one of the first things we did was we stuck a satellite transmitter on a loggerhead sea turtle. We named her Adelita, after the daughter of the fisherman that helped us glue the transmitter to the turtle. And we dropped her into the Pacific Ocean on the west coast of Baja. And Adelita decided that she was ready to go home. The only thing was that home was on the other side of the planet. And Adelita began to swim home. Across the open Pacific Ocean, one of the least inhabited parts of the world, at least by human beings, she swam through deep water. And she just never stopped, right past Hawaii. She just kept swimming and swimming. And we watched as she did that. She sent her signal every day. We put her data on the internet where she was mapped. And people all over the world started to follow Adelita as she made this epic journey. 12,000 kilometers from Baja to Japan. The first animal ever tracked across, swimming across an ocean basin. And we did something kind of audacious. Well, first of all, our colleagues said, well, turtles can't do that. But this one just did. So it turns out, well, maybe they can. And we put the data on the internet in real time. And our colleagues said, you can't do that. You can't share your data in real time. You have to hide it, and you have to store it, and then publish it later. And we thought, well, what would happen if somebody stole our turtle data? What do you do with stolen turtle data? <laughs> really? Is there a market for stolen turtle data? I, the only thing I could think of you could do is stolen turtle data is maybe save some turtles or teach some kids or do something creative or maybe give us some ideas that we needed. Maybe there are people smarter than us that could take our turtle data and do something with it that would be really nifty. Then we might collaborate. In fact, that's, what's, that's what happened. By sharing the data, we built a network of people all over the world and we started into this, this journey of generating more and more science. The collaboration ripped wide open. We became international sea turtle collaborators, and we produ have produced a, a mountain of science. The peer-reviewed literature on sea turtles has a big contribution coming from northwestern Mexico, and that's because of this open collaboration and sharing attitude that came out of this one turtle that swam across the Pacific Ocean. Now, we know now you know, science alone doesn't save anything. A pile of science doesn't save sea turtles. Laws alone don't save sea turtles. There's something more. We have this idea that economics and emotion are kind of in this struggle, that reason and emotion and feelings are in this struggle. But I see it otherwise. Economics and emotion work together to solve problems. Logic and reason combined with emotions and feelings is how we live. It's who we are. It's how we solve problems. We don't need to create this artificial debate between the two. And here's the upshot of the sea turtle situation. Best nesting season on record is happening right now, just about to wrap up, since 1978. And we have a long way to go to get back to where turtles once were, say 50 
75 years ago, but we're seeing things moving in the right direction. It's an emerging conservation success story. There are more black sea turtles in the water than anybody thought imaginable. People thought it was over for the black turtles, and it's not. And we're on our way to claiming victory for the sea turtles. Now, this is a happy, smiley face, maybe in a sea of sadness. If you read about the ocean, you know that we've got some problems. The ocean is in trouble. We've treated it very poorly. We've got some urgent ocean crises to solve. You don't have to look far. If you're a scientist, there's new news coming out every day. If you read the newspaper, it's there too. It's on television. We know we've got an abused ocean that we need to fix. Sea turtles manifest that impact as clearly as any other animal. This is a turtle pulled out of the Gulf of Mexico a few years back. Nothing sadder than pulling a sea turtle out of oil because sea turtles can't wipe their own eyes. And when they come up to the surface thinking that the oil slick is habitat, they're in for a really nasty surprise. We find plastic where it shouldn't be, like in the middle of seabirds, far, far away from human habitation like this albatross. No plastic should be inside of any wildlife, but there it is. And leatherback sea turtles swimming around the Pacific and Atlantic oceans, they do mistake plastic bags as jellyfish, their favorite food. And half of the leatherbacks out there right now have plastic in them right at this moment. We find pharmaceuticals, traces of pharmaceuticals in our waterways, in our lakes and our rivers and the oceans. We even find fragments of our outdoor gear, our, our wonderfully warm polyester jackets, eventually fragment and break down and they end up in the ocean. We find pesticides, fertilizers, and the ocean is warming and becoming more acidic. Genuine ocean crisis. There's no way around it. The facts are coming in. And our response to this crisis, it just isn't working. We're not doing the right things fast enough. We need to do more. We need to think more clearly. We need to act faster. We need to rethink our approach. We need to rethink our relationship with the ocean. But if I say rethink, what do we mean by that? What does rethinking involve? Well, it involves behavior change. We need to, and we need to understand our behavior, and we need to understand how to change it. But our understanding of the human brain has been very fundamental for a very long time. We used to study the brain like a black box. You stimulate it, and then you measure the response. But you really couldn't tell much about what was going on inside that black box that we call a skull. That's changing. Now we can look inside that black box and look at the brain. Now we can use some very interesting, powerful technology to look at what's going on inside the human brain, revolutionizing our understanding of ourselves. This is the golden age of neuroscience, some people believe. The field of cognitive science is exploding in the past few decades. We've been able to study our brains at the cellular level and learning about mirror neurons and pin neurons that help us map the world around us. Now the people who are embracing neuroscience are, some of them, are marketers. There's a whole field called neuromarketing. There's this book called Biology. Clever title, huh? Marketers know that the better understanding of how the brain works is an incredibly powerful tool, useful to get us to do things we may not want or need to do. They are understanding how brands connect emotionally not just by doing surveys and asking questions, but by looking at our brains in response to those brands. Coke knows that well. That's why they have a neuroscience lab in-house, and they invest money in neuroscience. Because it works. It's smart. If you're trying to communicate, it's good to understand how the brain works. At Stanford, I've been attending a, a conference for the past seven years that connects professional musicians, people in academia who study music with neuroscience to study our brain on music. This for the second year, the conference was about rhythm in the brain and music. This past year it was about auditory musical hallucinations, the neuroscience of musical hallucinations, otherwise known as hearing things. Now neuroscience is connected to happiness, music, 
magic. It's connected to the subconscious. It's connected to creativity, meditation. Neuroscience is collaborating with just about everybody, except for the ocean. And we're changing that. But we've had this deep emotional connection with the sea for all of human history. And we've depicted that through art, through literature, through poetry, through music. Sometimes it's one of fear and awe, and sometimes it's one of awe, solitude, relaxation, and love. For some people, going to the seaside is about relaxing and reducing stress, connecting with themselves, finding a moment of peace. When you step out there on the edge of the water, your mood changes instantly. I know when you're driving to the coast, up and down the hills, the first glimpse of the water, that first glimpse feels good. Sometimes we have contests to see who can see it first. And the person who wins the contest doesn't win any prize. They just win that feeling of saying, I saw it. I saw the sea. I saw it first. When we're out on the water, it's fun. Add water to any situation, and it's fun. If I gave everybody in this room some water pistols, the fun quotient would go up. You put, a, you put a hose into a sandbox, and the kids have fun. You add water to a balloon, and you've got pure joy. It's true. Water equals fun, especially when your friends are involved. You get out on the bow of a boat, and you watch the dolphins ride along with you, and everybody joins you. And the squeals and sounds of delight and laughter and joy are obvious. Nobody wants it to end. And when the dolphins decide it's time for them to leave, everybody's a little bit sad but fulfilled. Because the ocean is inspiring. It absolutely is. So if you take neuroscience and you pair it up with biodiversity conservation, what do you get? Let's find out. I call it neuroconservation. Now we can consider things like dignity as scientists. Wow, the science of dignity. How's that for a dissertation topic? The science of beauty, neuroesthetics. The science of compassion, the science of empathy. We need to know how compassion works, how to make more of it, how to stop the trend towards less compassion and empathy for nature and reverse that. How do we make empathy? And if we understand these things, how can we apply them to our communities? And how do we apply them to public health? How do we apply these concepts to healing? I think there's some enormous opportunities ahead. So the environmental movement likes to use fear and shame and sometimes way too much information to propel its agenda. And what that often does, it makes people sad ashamed, and they remember that it didn't do too well in organic chemistry. We remind them of that. And those are tools that can be useful, but if we use them alone, all we're doing is stressing people out more. We're causing fear and anxiety, which leads to physiological, physical, and cognitive emotional distress. And what does that do? Well, neuroscientists tell us when people are stressed out, they shop. They eat and they drink. We don't want that. That's not our goal. So we don't want to add to that pile of stress and fear and guilt. That's not our goal. People move towards their foundations. We want those foundations to be nature. We live in a world that's sort of in monkey mind mode. Most spiritualists and neuroscientists refer to it this way. Monkey mind is the, the always on, always distracted, always working, always thinking stressed out mode. It results in toxic stress and toxic stress impedes healing. It raises cortisol levels. It destroys neurons. Stress is bad for us and every medical doctor on the planet knows this now. 25 years ago that wasn't, that wasn't the case. The connection between stress and health is very clear. It used to be considered maybe a hippie idea from California that too much stress would make you sick. Now it's a mainstream medical concept. I call that mode that we live in much of the time red mind. And red mind is useful. It gets us out of trouble. 
It gets us away from that lion. It keeps us on the highway when we have to swerve to miss something. It's a quick response to danger. It's absolutely important. But blue mind is also important. That mode when you're relaxing, when the default mode network of your brain is engaged, which allows you to achieve insight. One of the ways to do that is to be out by the edge of the water. People save up their money all year long to take a vacation by the water. And when I ask them, what do you do when you go there? People say, I sit and I look at it. And I say, for a week? And they say, no, for two weeks. <laughs> well, I dive in it and every cell in my body is alive. And I feel like myself when I get in the water. Or I just stand out there and feel small and enormous and whole and human and alive. Some people go there just to stop thinking. And that's, in fact, that's what happens. Your brain gets a little vacation. You connect to yourself and you connect to the one you're with. People go to the ocean for honeymoons and to profess their love to each other over and over and over. Why are we drawn to have our, our most precious ceremonies next to water? We're just engaged in that way. Now this all sounds fuzzy and like I'm from Santa Cruz County, California, I bet, right about now. <laughs> I was born in Manhattan, so I'm not a native Californian, but there is science backing up every single thing I've said. And I spent earlier this week with my colleagues at the University of Exeter Medical School who are doing some of the leading research on Blue Mind. It's very exciting. Connecting neuroscience, psychology, geography, sociology to the study of the ocean. It's absolutely fascinating. The research is coming in every day, it seems like. Every year there's another, another new publication or five. And there's some in the pipeline right now that will, no pun intended, blow your mind. I'm very excited to, to be on uh, the team with these guys and gals and asking questions about our brain on water that I think will transform our understanding of who we are and how we interact with water. Now there's water all around us. It seems like such an obvious set of questions. Why has it taken us so long to dig in like this? We've known that we've paid for this cognitive premium, this cognitive service. Ocean views can cost from 40 to 300 percent more than non-ocean views. Same kind of real estate. Without the water view, you pay less. Elephants even know about this stuff, for gosh sakes. Elephants love the ocean because it helps us relax, helps us connect to ourselves, helps us to become better versions of ourselves. Richard Louv, who wrote The Nature Principle as well as Last Child in the Woods, talks about nature neurons, the possibility that being in nature actually makes healthier, more neurons. Think about that. Think about the transformation in how we approach public health and education, how we approach conservation that's possible if we have this information in our hands and we use it wisely and we share it with everyone. We hold a conference every year called Blue Mind. This year it will be in Block Island, the end of May, and I'm here to announce for the first time in 2014, we're going to hold it in Cornwall. Blue Mind 4 will be in Cornwall with some of the leaders of this new field called neuroconservation. And you know we're going to be standing out on those cliffs, just taking it in, enjoying that beautiful ocean. Now, just a side story. Here's my friend Martin Pollock from Cornwall. He returned from Afghanistan, missing one of his arms and both of his legs. He came to visit us in Santa Cruz, and we spent the week surfing. And Martin learned to balance himself on the surfboard, to use his prosthetic paddle arm, and to hop up on what's left of his legs. And the guy is a heck of a surfer now. It's amazing. I'm proud to count him as a friend. And he tells me that the ocean is saving his life. It's helping him heal his body. It's motivating him to stay in rehab and continue to fit his prosthetics and make his body strong. Because it may not have worked out that way for Martin. So the ocean and being by the ocean makes us feel better, but it's not just about how we feel, how each of us feels alone. It's how we feel together. 
Emotions are a social activity. Our emotions affect one another. Just as brains can do things that no neuron can do, so can networks of brains change the world together. And that's what it's going to take. A bunch of people getting their blue minds on, working together for what we love. We know the ocean provides vast economic and ecosystem services. There's a lot of conversations about ecosystem services. But let's not forget, it provides equally vast cognitive services and benefits that are incre increasingly quantifiable. So this is no silver bullet. Neuroconservation isn't just suddenly going to save everything, but is an important tool that we now have in our toolbox. Because as my childhood hero and Paul's alike said, people protect what they love. And I would add one word to that quote, sometimes. Let's see if we can move sometimes to more of the times, to all of the times. Let's see if we can get there together. That's our goal, to connect with what we love and protect it. So next time you're out there in nature, enjoying those cognitive benefits, let everybody know that you love that. Let everybody know how you feel when you come back. Share how you feel in any way that feels right to you. The way you express your love for your children, the way you express the love for your friends, the love for your amazing clubs and your maps and your trips, maybe your car. Express your love for nature equally as passionately. There's nothing I love more than spending time in the water with my girls. There's nothing better in this world than being in the water with those I love. So I've brought a simple gift for you. It's just a blue marble. And if you have it handy, just get a hold of that. And this blue marble represents us. If you hold it up, that's what we look like from a million miles away right now. If you could look at where we're sitting, we look like that blue marble. And neuroscientists tell me the human brain likes three dimensions better than two dimensions. We love spheres better than any other shape. And the color blue makes us pretty happy. So it's a nice gift, neuroscientifically speaking. <laughs> I researched it a little bit before I picked it for you. And I just want to ask you to take your blue marble and carry it, put it in a safe place and carry it with you. Have it remind you of what you love about our little blue planet. But I want to ask you to give it away to someone eventually and share your gratitude with them for what they do to fix what's broken on our planet. Put it in their hand, look them in the eye, and thank them like you mean it. Because there are a lot of people we need to say thank you to, that we owe it a nice, warm bit of gratitude. Put the blue marble in their hand and pass it on. And remind them that we're on this little blue planet together, and that means everything we do matters. And we're going to work together. And we're going to use all the science we can get our hands on. And we're going to solve some of these problems. Because that's what we do. Thank you. Well, great stuff. Thank you, uh, Jay. Well, we've had two fantastic presentations. I don't know about you, but I'm in a perfect state of mind now because I'm excited about the 600-person Earthwatch trip with, with Anna, and we'll do it with our blue minds. Thank you, Jay. And I, I've, we've now got about uh, 20 minutes to take uh, difficult questions and insights and comments from you and also for those who joined us on the webinar. So if I can invite Anna and Jay up on stage and then uh, we'll take your questions. So we are ready. Great. And we've worked out the way we'll do this is um, I'll take, um, say, two questions from, from the theater, 
and then one from the webinar. And Rachel up there is going to read out the uh, webinar question. So we've got roving microphones, and um, as a bottom dweller myself, I've got some higher thinkers either side of me, so we're brave enough to take any questions. Who's first? Ah, yes, thank you. Sorry, at the back. The nature of these things with a roving mic is that the, the, the next one will be over here, you see, you know how it works. Sorry. And you can address your question to anybody or all of us or even someone in the audience. We're, we're Hi, so, um, oh. <laughs> um, I, I, lo I love to be as passionate as you are about um, the positivity. And I'm sure every single one of us in this room right now is being really positive about what we can do. And when we step into nature, we feel brilliant. But I'm just thinking about the reality of for example, uh, I live in Indonesia, um, where the reality of it is that most people are going through a, a stage of urbanization. Um, I live right next to a forest, but no one really cares about the forest that they live next to. In fact, they do things that are damaging the forest severely. People in, you know, I'm about to move to Africa next year, and the forest is vanishing because the population is growing. And to eat. So how do we, we're all, we're all feeling connected with, with, uh, with nature, but how do we connect with people um, who actually live right next to it and depend on forests and oceans and rivers for their everyday livelihood? How do we help to conserve nature with people who live right next to it and because of continuing population growth, urbanization and the need to feed themselves and earn money? Um, how do we connect them with yeah, well, fantastic. what a fantastic first question. Thank you very much. You had a quick discussion. Are you going to take it, Jay? You can take it. Hang on a second. We all want to. We all want to bite at it. You go first. Sure. Well, I really I can't speak to all different kinds of communities. I think that each situation will have its own its own set of circumstances. I know in northern New Mexico, um, one of the really important things that we've learned in developing this preserve is that it can't be a place that stands apart from human interaction. I mean, I, I hope I, I made that point relative to the depth of human use of the place. But when you look more in the contemporary realm, we started the preserve, the trust experiment, um, with public um, interaction. We set up listening sessions that we held during the first three years. I, I don't remember how many there were, but there were numerous listening sessions. We went and we listened to what people wanted from these places. Sometimes what they wanted was they wanted to graze their cattle there. And that was the main thing they wanted. Some other people really wanted the chance to get out there and fish. Some people wanted to hunt. And they wanted to make sure that they weren't losing those opportunities because of some highfalutin preserve that was coming along. So it was important that we heard what people wanted and we designed access to the place and communicated um, the shared values between some of those interests and some of the more conservation-minded interests. So I think that, um, again, every situation is going to be different, but in this particular place, making sure that the landscape and the community are integrated and entwined is an absolutely essential part of land management. I haven't worked in Africa, but I've worked in Indonesia a lot with some great successes worked with a, a man who on an island who he and his family were in charge of collecting every single turtle egg for 40 years uh, and now he is, is protecting them and when he got to release the first baby turtle in a very long time the look of joy on his face was very obvious uh, he seemed to love that little baby turtle pretty much and understood that its role in making sure that there would be turtles around into the future uh, so I understand the, the, um, the sentiment and that as a marine biologist and conservationist live with it every day in our work throughout Latin America and, and Asia, um, but where our, our team has really dug in and spent time working with people and finding solutions and connecting emotionally, uh, doing research and coming up with, with strategies, we've had good success. Uh, so I think it's, it's possible. 
Thanks, Ryan. I knew the answer had to be something to do with turtles, but just, uh, I bless you for the question, because I immediately look at Nigel. There's a project that Nigel and uh, the team and, and I ran here called the Shoals of Capricorn Program, and one, one small part of that was to how to stop fishermen walking across the reef, um, co collecting almost just everything and, and wrecking it on the, on the way. And we did it by having training the young ones the importance of uh, marine conservation issues and actually substituting some of the fishing income, which wasn't sustainable, into tourism income. They became tourism guides and now the fishing itself has become sustainable. So we're, in this building itself, we've got personal experience of uh, making it happen. So thank you very much for the question. Next one, please. Hi, um, I'm a social scientist. I work for a large engineering company in Britain um, and I'm in the somewhat luxurious position of working on um, the psychological attachment that people have to um, natural landscapes um, and how environmental um, changes brought about by industrial projects um, can cause psychological distress to people when it results in changes in the natural environment around them that gives them a sense of place, belonging, well-being, community um, and things like that. Um, I'm aware that to um, be able to present such arguments to developers in the government in this country is quite a luxurious position in comparison to countries where people like myself, um, say in developing countries, would just be trying to preserve the agricultural landscape to guarantee people access to uh, livelihood resources, but I just wondered in your experience of looking at the relationship between psychology and well-being um, and, and nature, whether you come across any really strong examples of actual um, development or policy changes that had been brought about persuading um, governments or developers not to interfere with a natural landscape on the basis of psychological evidence and you know the simple fact of people's attachment to it being good for their quality of life and well-being because outside the you know the sort of northwestern um, hemisphere environment I can't imagine such arguments being very high on policy tables. Very well. Who wants to go for it? Oh I'll go for it. Yes I'll go for it. You know, my, my comment is I'm, I grew up in Bromford Essex which is a you know very sort of urban environment and there's a lot of industry within me and there's something about living close to industry that I like. I've got no trouble living close to industry because I can keep my eye on it. You know, if industry is something that happens in some, some developing country and then we get cheap clothing, then we all seem a bit remote from it. But I like living near industry. I really do. I think, you know, industry that we can learn to live along with and keep a monitoring eye on it and keep, can actually add to our engagement with nature. You know, I, saw, I was just in, in, in Docklands a couple of nights ago, and the power of that big, big old Docklands with the river and, you know, big powerful night seemed to really excite me. It wasn't the same as getting the blue mind, but there is something about that engagement with, with industry. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> I live next to uh, organic strawberry fields, and those, <laughs> God, those strawberries are awesome. Just to look at them, just, you know, nice and small and sweet. Uh, you know, in the town that I live in, Davenport, we had a, uh, a very large, 100-year-long-lived uh, cement plant that recently closed down. And it was part of the town. And the cement dust fell on people's heads and roofs and cars, and, and they hated it, but it was part, part of Davenport. Um, now it's closed, and part of that is because of uh, the chromium-6 uh, that was found in the soil and recognition of the, the health hazards related to that, uh, potentially in the schoolyard, et cetera. So, but to your question, I don't know of any um, situations where the, the neuropsychology of a community has been studied in depth and used as uh, an, an argument along with others for uh, the suspension redirection or termination of, of a large industrial project yet. Um, I thought about that a lot during the Gulf oil spill. Uh, people were calculating the, the numbers of dead animals, the cost to the tourism industry, the cost to the fisheries industry, an enormous cost when you add it all up. What wasn't being calculated was the psychological cost. 
of, of anxiety, stress, depression, and so forth, and what that means for the people who now can't even look at the ocean and feel the relief, who can't go fishing and feel the pride of, of, of doing their, their career, uh, and how that manifests itself back in the home, and how that translates through the community in a very real way. It has very, very clear economic impacts. Um, so I imagine neuroconservation will advance that conversation strongly, effectively, and very rigorously from a scientific point of view. It will allow us to stand up and talk about this stuff uh, in, a, in a much more rigorous way in the near future. Well, that's a much broader answer than I can, uh, I can give, but, and I, I can't really address the, the policy aspect of the question that you asked. But I would like to say before that, to thank you for the work that you're doing. It sounds like it's a real contribution. Um, I can just give a small story from our setting, and that is as the preserve was created, and that meant a cessation of logging. And um, uh, one of the local loggers, Archie McKellar, was instantly put out of business, um, and potentially a business that he could never regain um, with, with these lands gone. Um, but two things came out of that down the line, out of the preserve, that were entirely unexpected. One is, I, because of Archie's generosity, he came into the office, sat with me, and taught me over time how he had been logging. And then he took myself and the natural resources coordinator out on tours because he was so proud of the way that he had logged. And in fact, it's spectacular. You actually can't even tell that he logged there. What a surprise. I didn't know that the most prolific, effective, um, conservationist on the Valles Caldera had been the logger who had worked there. That was an unknown to me, something I hadn't anticipated, and I learned a lot from that. But the other part of this is as we move forward with this large collaborative landscape restoration project, it involves a great deal of thinning. Well, we're cutting down a lot of trees, and in the United States there really isn't much market for that tree is because there aren't very many houses being built. So you have all of this wood, and we've um, created uh, I, not myself, I can't take any credit for this, but again, our director and our natural resources coordinator have created a new industry in collaboration with the tribal government, one of the tribal governments in the area, Hamas Pueblo, called the Wallato Woodlands Initiative. They're creating a whole bunch of wood products that had never existed before, had nothing to do with construction, all of them putting to good use the biomass being brought off of the, the landscape. Again, something that we had not anticipated um, in, in early on the early days. So there's a whole bunch of different things that can come out of, of new initiatives if we have a, clear, a clarity of purpose of why we're making these decisions. There's all sorts of initiatives that can develop that we hadn't realized was, were possible. Oh, great stuff. We'll get some great questions. Yes. Thank you very much. I was in the hello. Um, I was in the supermarket a few months ago with my four-year-old uh, niece, and we walked past the meat counter, and she looked at the meat and she said, "What's what's that, Oliver?" And I said, "Oh, that's our beef. We might have some lasagna tonight." And she said, "Oh, okay." And then we walked past the fish counter, and she looked at that and said, "Oh, I know what that is. That's a fish." And I said, well, "Why do you know that?" She said, "Well, it's got a head on." Um, and it, it's an odd story, but it raises the question, which I, never, I didn't appreciate before, which was, why are we so disconnected from, from our fish? That if someone had put a head of a sheep in our supermarket, we would all be in uproar, it would be in the Daily Mail, and everyone would be yeah, deeply upset about it. But when we walk past the fish counter, we're perfectly happy to see a head of a fish. Um, we have this emotional disconnection with our fish for some reason. We turn on the TV, and we'll happily see a fish being skewered as part of a fishing program. If someone skewered a sheep to death on TV, we would get really upset about it. So where is this disconnect from, where, and where is it going when it comes to our fish? I'll give this to you, Jane. But, but, but you know, it's interesting because I fish a lot in, in Norway, um, in Oslo Fjord. I have a dear friend there, and when we're on the back of her boat, and we get mackerel or cod, before, before you know, we either break their head or cut the head off, we always apologize to the fish. And it's some sort of lovely little Norwegian tradition where you say, well, I'm you know, really sorry. It doesn't stop us eating them and having that relationship. But there is that engagement. You know, I don't know if that's in all uh, Scandinavian countries, but it certainly exists in Norway. It's quite a, quite a nice sort of touching moment. You hear this thing comes up and you apologize uh, to, to him and, um, and you eat him. Uh, 
<laughs> Interesting question. I, I don't completely know the answer from you know an evolutionary psychology point of view, but perhaps some someone has studied studied that. But there's you know maybe everybody's so well educated in in evolutionary biology that they have a sense of of cladistics and distance of of our our mammalian relatives and our, our fish relatives. I don't think that's the answer. Um, but have you ever kissed a fish? It's very different from kissing a cow or a sheep. It's very <laughs> massively different. <laughs> All right, well, I am sorry. I was meant to go for a webinar question there, but I'm not quite sure where to look. Is it up there? Great. Let's have it. Yes, our first question from the webinar is from Jennifer McCreer, who is tuning in from Nova Scotia. She would like to ask Jay a question. She says, I'm wondering if you were able to monitor the collaborative process among invested stakeholders, collaborators, in the Turtle Project, and if so, how you tracked the development of the network effort, and what was your focus? Was it learning, trust, commitment, efficiency, etc., including the engagement or lack thereof of community members? Uh, yes. <laughs> We did, and the, uh, we have sociologists, anthropologists on our team who have looked at the, the connections between people and, and you know, what, what really happens when people feel the dignity and the pride. And, but really what we, what we did that was successful in, in just a, sh a short answer is that we took a skill that was been, had been around for a long time, hunting turtles with nets, and we repurposed it. And so turtle hunters became turtle researchers and turtle guides. And their skill was honored, and they felt good about it. They collected the data, helped analyze the data, and now are presenting the data at conferences themselves. Some of them have now started their own nonprofit organizations, and those nonprofit organizations protect water quality, sea turtles, and other ocean wildlife. So we, we took a, an, an evil, quote unquote, and turned it into a positive and turned it into a, a, a new way of making a livelihood. And not, you know, not every turtle hunter can now be an executive director of an NGO. That's not really realistic. But the idea um, has, ca has caught on. And, and um, it gets harder and harder to, to take the last few turtles when more and more people are moving towards making a living uh, or being connected to them being alive. And so uh, that's the, the general process and then there's much more to it than that involving kids and, and other members of society besides the fishing community. Great. Thanks, Jay. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I've been given a cut two signals now that we've, we've finished um, questions. Um, and it's down to me now to hand over to Ben from Earthwatch to do the closing remarks. But then we'll be available in the bar for your comments, insights, and um, certainly we'll invite more difficult questions. Um, because we're on a real good roll now, but I'm getting loads of signals everywhere that we've we run out of time. So look, thank you very much indeed, and I'll introduce uh, Ben Jack from Earthwatch. Thanks, Ben. Cheers, Paul. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Uh, Nigel's asking on stage to say a few thank yous. I think he's asked me, at least in part, because he knows I'm struggling with the best man speech I've got to give in two weeks. <laughs> And he wants to give me a, a little bit of practice in front of an audience that is perhaps slightly more sober and less inclined to heckle. So uh, please uh, don't prove him wrong. <laughs> um, but all the same, despite the degree of coercion, it's, um, it's great to have the opportunity to say a big Earthwatch thank you to Jay and Anna for two um, truly thought-provoking and fantastic talks. Um, and of course, to Paul for your expert sharing. Thanks so much. Um, I also wanted to thank the, the extensive Earthwatch team who work tirelessly behind the scenes to make these events run so smoothly. Uh, and also just to reiterate Nigel's word of thanks to the Mitsubishi Corporation Fund for Europe and Africa, because without them, these events wouldn't happen. So thank you. <laughs> of course, the theme of tonight's talks um, it really resonates and sits very closely with the, uh, the work of Earthwatch because through our portfolio of around 50 projects worldwide, we don't just mobilize an army of citizen scientists to collect data and to support our field teams. We also give people a very unique personal opportunity to connect with the natural world. And I think 
one of the strongest messages that's come out of tonight is that that personal connection is in fact just as important as the data that's being collected, the rational component, because it's that personal connection with the natural world that really um, inspires a sense of agency and encourages action and decision making. Um, tonight we've got a, a special opportunity for you to find out a bit more about our work. Please do um, join us for the Earthwatch Roadshow, which is about to begin, conveniently located by the bar, which is always useful. And, um, and there you can find out a bit more about the many and varied projects that we're working on. Uh, tonight we have research in Oman, we have our forays into social media, into web apps and smartphone apps, and we also have um, some work we've been doing with, with UK teachers called Teacher Climate Change Training Programme. So please do go and um, meet the Earthwatch team. Anna, Jay and Paul are also about to be ushered to the bar where they will be lurking around on the hunt for free drinks, but I'm sure we'll answer more questions if you've got them, so please go and collar them too. Um, on your way out, um, I just wanted to draw your attention to the strategically placed buckets um, for your donations. You won't be surprised to hear that Earthwatch are operating in an incredibly challenging financial landscape, and we really do rely on um, donations from people such as yourselves to help us do the work we do. So I would really encourage you to give generously tonight, and also please consider becoming a, a member of Earthwatch and um, donating to us on a regular basis. One last thing on my list is just to um, a date for your diaries. The 17th of October is the next Earthwatch event, and we will be debating whether we should legalize the trade of endangered species in order to conserve them. So please do join us for a night of what promises to be very genuine debate on a, on a very current and quite controversial subject, so one not to miss. I think that's all for me. Um, all that's left to be said is thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, and I hope to see you in the bar.